World War II is full of awful things, shining a big old spotlight on the worst side of humanity, and in many cases, the best. It's also full of stories that make you go, that's not real, is it? Truth, like the largely mail-ordered tank division, is stranger than fiction. Concentration camps were singularly terrible places, and there were a lot of them, around 44,000 of varying types and sizes, according to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. But for this, let's look at Buchenwald. Adolf Hitler was famously fond of his dog Blondie, but it turns out that's not the only animals that got the A-OK -okay from high-ranking Nazi officials. Buchenwald actually contained a small zoo on the grounds, a zoo that wasn't too far from the crematorium. At the time the zoo opened in 1938, the camp was under the control of Carl Koch and his wife Ilse. On a side note, she was the one who liked to select prisoners who had what she deemed the most artistic tattoos, have them killed, skinned, and made into things like lampshades and gloves. The zoo was, of course, both funded by assets seized from the prisoners and off-limits to all those save the ones who were tasked with taking care of the animals, which included monkeys, birds, and fish. The idea was that it was meant to provide diversion and entertainment for guards who wanted to go there on their breaks. Coke liked to go there, too, because there was also a bear pit, and he was particularly fond of throwing people in and watching the carnage. World War II devastated Europe. Millions were homeless, entire towns and villages were destroyed, and even major cities suffered unthinkable damage. Take Warsaw. World War II historian Keith Lowe says that about 90% of the city had been destroyed, and it was like that across the landscape. Except for the German city of Konstanz, this little German town made it through the entire war without being bombed once, without being attacked, and essentially remained completely untouched. How? A bluff of epic proportions. Blackouts were the norm across Europe. At night, cities descended into darkness in an attempt to hide from enemy bombers. Konstanz simply kept all their lights on. Konstanz sits right along the German border with Switzerland, which was a neutral country. When they noticed that the nearby Swiss town of Koinslingen kept their lights on, confident that they weren't going to be targeted by either side, the whole town of Konstanz sort of collectively shrugged and said, we can do that too, actually. They did, and it totally worked. The ancient city was never attacked by Allied bombers who thought they must be Swiss because no German town would be crazy enough to keep the lights on. It's easy to assume that the American military was a well-oiled machine that was super prepared for the inevitable entry into World War II. The country had a ton of time to prepare, after all, but that wasn't the case at all, as General George S. Patton very quickly learned. First, let's point out that Patton was among the era's ultra-rich. He had family ties to George Washington and English and Welsh nobility. It also didn't hurt that he married into a massive industrialist family. That meant that he had the personal wealth to outfit his own armored tank division, and he absolutely did, by ordering parts and supplies from the widely popular Sears Roebuck. At the time, Sears Roebuck was the country's largest retailer, and it's a good thing, too. When he was placed in command of the 2nd Armored Division, they didn't have anywhere near the gear they needed to head into battle, so Patton ordered everything from tools and replacement parts to wash basins from the mail order catalog and told them to send him the bill. He never revealed how much it all came to, but he financed it all himself. Bombing runs might usually have a target that needs to be destroyed, but on January 30th, 1943, Royal Air Force bombers headed out with another objective in mind. They wanted to get on the radio. The day was a significant one because there was a whole host of events planned to celebrate Hitler's 10 years in power. At the time, the German public still kind of thought that the Luftwaffe was going to protect them from serious Allied attacks from above. But the number 105 squadron proved just how incorrect that was by buzzing Hermann Goering as he gave a speech hailing his great Fuhrer. The British knew exactly when he was going to start his speech, and more importantly, they knew it was going to be broadcast across Germany. So they sent two aptly named de Havilland Mosquitoes to buzz by Gehring and the Nazi Broadcasting Company, providing background music for a speech. Audio text cut the feed, but epically, they did the same thing to Joseph Goebbels a few hours later. One of the bombers was shot down as they headed for home, but the whole incident led Gehring to rant, they have the geniuses and we have the nimcompoops. By the time Sir Adrian Carton de Viar headed out to the front lines of World War II, he had already plenty of experience under his belt. He'd served in the Boer War and World War I, and he'd suffered some insane injuries. In addition to losing his hand and left eye, he'd also been shot in pretty much every place someone can take a bullet, including the back of his head, groin, and ear. He was hurt and sent to the same hospital so many times that he kept a pair of PJs there for his inevitable return. And that's no joke. During World War II, he was stationed in a few different places before things got real, and he got sent to Yugoslavia as part of a diplomatic mission. A plane was shot down, and he was captured and sent to Italy's Vincigliata Castle. 
The fact that they were just 200 miles from the Swiss border was enough to make the now elderly de Villard determined to escape, and he did after he and his fellow prisoners dug a 60-foot escape tunnel through the castle's bedrock. He managed to stay on the run for eight days until he was recaptured. Released a few years later, he went on to become Churchill's representative in China until he retired and passed away peacefully in 1963. There are hundreds of monkeys living on Gibraltar. They become so accustomed to and unafraid of people that using the words massive pest to describe them wouldn't be incorrect. They're skilled pickpockets, and they so strongly identify shopping bags with food that locals keep their groceries in their cars. But why are they there? That's an interesting story. For centuries, there's been sort of an urban legend that's very similar to the one told about the ravens at the Tower of London. This one said that if Gibraltar ever found itself monkey-free, British rule there would end. By 1942, there were only a few monkeys left. With everything that was going on in the world, no one can really blame Churchill for not wanting to take the risk of there being some legit truth to the old tale. So he issued a top-secret order to repopulate the island with macaques. And they did. It was only in 2005 that NBC News reported the mystery of where exactly they had come from was solved. DNA testing on Gibraltar's current monkey residents revealed that they had been sourced from both native locations of Morocco and Algeria. And yes, they're thriving. The idea that Adolf Hitler had an anti-Nazi half-Irish nephew named Patty Hitler sounds insane, but it's absolutely true. And the more famous Hitler often called him his, quote, loathsome nephew. Patty was the son of Hitler's half-brother, Alois, who was working in a Dublin hotel when he met Bridget Dowling. They married, and William Patrick came along in 1911. Hey, everybody. My name is Willy Hitler. Adolf Hitler is my uncle. He's gonna hook me up. Although Patty spent some time living in Germany in the late 1930s, he and his half-uncle didn't exactly see eye to eye. He was working for Opel when, rumor has it, he threatened to come forward with the family's Jewish ancestry. When Uncle Adolf responded by insisting he become a German citizen, Patty decided it was time to get out of Dodge, or Berlin, as it were. By 1939, Patty and his mother were living in the U.S., and Patty didn't just write articles like, Why I Hate My Uncle. He also enlisted in the U.S. Navy and served in the war. Afterwards, they changed their name to Stuart Houston, which is admittedly better than going by either Patty Hitler or even Bill Hitler. Bridget died in 1969 and Patty in 1987, and Patty did continue the family line with three sons. They, however, reportedly made a pact to never have children and end the Hitler line. They kept that pact. Boom. Boom in your face, Hitler. Blackmailed might be kind of a strong term. What Doris Castleross did was to strongly suggest that if Winston Churchill didn't want her to go public with their affair, he'd take her back to Britain with him and make sure things went well. During World War II, Churchill was famously married to Clementine, who was often depicted as one half of a power couple. Rumors that he'd been having an affair were easy to discount. But in 2018, The Guardian reported that both photos and old interviews with his private secretaries had surfaced, confirming that yes, he had an affair with Lady Doris Castleross. It went on throughout the 1930s, and they headed off to France together for some time alone. It was during that time that he painted several portraits, and that, it turns out, was a mistake. Churchill technically ended the fling at the onset of World War II, but it predictably wasn't over just yet. After spending some time in the U.S., Castle Ross decided she wanted to go home, and Churchill was her ticket. When he went to the States for a 1942 meeting with Roosevelt, she showed up too, with paintings that proved her side of the story and ultimately got her a ticket home. The entire story was later corroborated by her sister-in-law, Caroline Delevingne. And yes, Churchill's lover was the great aunt of model and actress Cara Delevingne. Surely the Nazis weren't working on building a Death Star, were they? Actually, it was 1923 and a Nazi scientist named Hermann Oberth proposed building a massive mirror and launching it into Earth's orbit. The idea was that it could be controlled by a crew who lived on an attached space station and it could be turned to focus on points on the Earth's surface. Imagine it like a giant magnifying glass, humankind as the ants and Nazis as the bullies frying them on the sidewalk. News says that the plans were among the many, many documents that fell into Allied hands at the end of the war, and they were ultimately replicated and preserved in Life magazine. Oberth didn't forget about it either. He survived the war and was pushing his idea for more peaceful applications well into the 1960s. He believed that it could be used to control weather patterns, terraform deserts, and concentrate the sun's energy for optimal use as a renewable energy source. Oberth also insisted that his project was much, much more practical than just trying to get to the moon, and space mirrors were what NASA really should be concentrating on. Jeffrey Pike was a bit of a unique individual. 
According to The Guardian, when he couldn't find a school that was good enough for his son, he turned his attention to first mastering the art of trading stocks to earn cash, then use that cash to found an acceptable school. It's not entirely surprising, then, that the same mind was the one who came up with one of the most bizarre plans for the British fleet. He was trying to come up with a way to combat the German U-boats and reasoned this. Icebergs were hard to sink, so why not make an aircraft carrier out of what was essentially a massive iceberg? Project Habakkuk was born. The original plan to use an actual iceberg towed down from the Arctic didn't work, so they came up with the idea to build a huge warship with an ice base and a heavy landing deck. The planned ship was 2,000 feet long and would be able to carry 300 planes. And here's where Canada comes in. R&D set up on Alberta's Lake Patricia, and while it looked promising at first, the plan didn't progress beyond the construction of a 60-foot-long prototype. Why? More effective aircraft and the development of radar made it obsolete before it was built. The entire thing was abandoned. The ice ultimately melted, but as of 2018, divers have confirmed that the more durable parts of the project were still there. This one's twofold. The Nazis, it turns out, were running two programs to try to create the perfect forces. One was headquartered at a long-lost stud farm in what is now Czechia, or as most people call it, the Czech Republic. In 1942, Nazi scouts started buying and moving purebred lipid xanners to the remote breeding facility where they were joined by hand-selected Arabians. The idea was to combine the two into a new breed, which would have incredible stamina and be energetic but manageable. Most importantly, it would be pure white. It was estimated that by inbreeding the small group of hand-picked stock, the breeds would be overhauled into one perfect Aryan horse in just three years. It actually did kind of work. By 1944, the stud farm was home to a herd of pure white horses. They were still there at the end of the war, and in 1946, Americans evacuated them ahead of the advancing Russian army. Some were returned to the States and the horse farm of W.K. Kellogg. Meanwhile, other Nazi scientists were trying to bring back another breed from extinction. Lutz Heck of the Berlin Zoo used animals like the Polish Konik Pony to try to recreate extinct once-wild tarpons through careful breeding. Many of these animals were slaughtered and eaten in the post-war chaos, but the descendants of these so-called heck horses are still around and can be seen living in small herds across Europe. Theresienstadt was unique among the thousands of concentration camps set up by the Nazis in that it served a few different purposes. In addition to being a way station where prisoners were sent before being shuffled off towards their oftentimes very final destination, it was also used for holding specific groups, including World War I veterans and the elderly. It was also the concentration camp the Germans showed other nations to assure them that, nope, there's nothing shady going on here at all. It really started in 1944, when Denmark wanted to know what was being done with all their Jews. Theresienstadt got a makeover, which included newly paved streets, a playground, and 1,200 rose bushes. Even as 7,500 people were transferred to Auschwitz to make it seem a little more like the happy little community they said it was, and not like the prison camp it actually was. They went all out, holding operas and concerts in public areas and outfitting shops with shiny new things that prisoners definitely weren't allowed to have. The Danish were so impressed by it that the Nazis decided to make a promotional film there. It was called The Fuhrer Gives a City to the Jews, and the inmate that filmed it was executed in Auschwitz not long after. Theresienstadt says the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum became known as a spa town and comfortable retirement community for Europe's elderly Jews. It was not. I must say I sat there and didn't know whether it would be water or gas. It was water. In 2015, The Telegraph reported on the presentation of the Legion d'Honneur Medal to 3,000 soldiers who helped liberate France from Nazi occupation. Among them was the British Bob Roberts, who had an incredible story of cheating death on multiple occasions, including the time when a sniper shot just grazed his scalp instead of killing him instantly. Roberts was a diminutive figure. Standing just 5 foot 3 inches, he would have been exempt from service under earlier British Army regulations. And it's his height that made it particularly hilarious that he was sent to accept the surrender of the tallest man in the Nazi army. Yakov Nakin was listed often as either 7 foot 6 or 7 foot 3. In reality, he was probably 6 foot 11, but regardless, he towered over Roberts as he searched him and accepted the surrender. Roberts later remembered that, yes, everyone there had thought it was funny, saying, I didn't take a lot of notice of this guy at the time, but my mates who were watching the rest of the men saw this giant of a guy approach me, and I was aware they and the Germans were having a good laugh. The National Canine Defense League called it the September Holocaust, and they were talking about what was happening to Britain's once-beloved pets. It started with a 1939 pamphlet called Air Raid Precautions for Animals. 
In it, the Home Office recommended city dwellers send their pets to the country to keep them safe, but it included the unfortunate sentiment, if you cannot place them, it really is kindest to have them destroyed. And that's what people did on a shocking scale. An estimated 750,000 pets were killed in a single week in September, mostly by families concerned of rumors of food shortages. There was a widespread outcry from animal charities like the RSPCA, with newspapers running reminders like the one from the Daily Mirror. Putting your pets to sleep is a very tragic decision. Do not take it before it is absolutely necessary. Thousands more were abandoned and rescued. The four staff members of the Battersea Dogs and Cats Home cared for a shocking 145,000 abandoned pets throughout the war years, while the Duchess of Hamilton founded her own sanctuary to save hundreds of others. Still, the push for euthanasia was so great that the crematoriums couldn't keep up. Bodies piled in the streets, and the NCDL donated some of their land for a mass grave, which was the final resting place of half a million beloved pets. The projected pet food shortage never happened, and pet food was never rationed.